Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for those of you, you that have joined so far. I can still people I can still see that people are joining as I speak, um, but I'll, I'll carry on anyway. Um, we've got a little bit of introductions and housekeeping to do before we get into the main meat of the session anyway. Um, but as I say, th thanks very much for joining. I hope this is going to be interesting for all of you. The session's all around kind of asset visibility, compliance monitoring, giving you our NHS customers the ability to kind of see everything in one place first and foremost and then uh, hopefully help you with some of the risk reduction and, and kind of compliance um, jobs that you have to go through on a regular basis so um, in terms of housekeeping usual stuff really we we record these sessions as, as a default so we'll make this recording available to you guys and for those of you that that haven't been able to make it on the day um, so that it can be watched back at yours or your colleagues' leisure. Um, questions, we kind of want them. It's really, really helpful if you can post your questions as we go through. Hopefully you'll be able to see the question panel as part of the GoToWebinar feature where you can post those. I'll be monitoring those as we go through. And likewise, there'll be a survey at the end, which we'd be grateful if you could complete. The feedback helps us plan uh, future sessions. So in terms of who's, who's kind of who's hosting, who, who are your speakers today. Most of you will know me, I'm Andy Sherritt, uh, official title head of business development here. So I'll, I'll be hosting the session, um, dealing with any questions. Uh, joined by James from Cinerio. James, if you want to say hi. Yeah, good afternoon all. Thank you for joining today. Uh, James Jones, Regional Sales Director at Cinerio. I think I spoke to quite a lot of people on the call already as well. I'll just be talking about uh, Cinerio, what we are, what we do and how we do it. Thanks, James. And Jake is very kindly joined to give a kind of a an Isle of Wight point of view. Jake, if you could just say hi as a comms test. Jake, are you, are you receiving? Hi, everyone. Sorry, that's that's better. Uh, yeah. Jake Gully from the Isle of Wight, and we'll do formal introductions in a second. Great stuff. Thanks. Uh, we'll we'll be on to that momentarily, to be honest. I've got just the usual slide that I like to show to kind of give it a little bit of an overview of IT health, conscious that most of you on the call are already working with us as customers, so I don't need to go into too much depth. But, you know, equally, some of you may be newer customers or some of you I haven't had the actual chance to meet properly. Um, so, yeah, we've 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 become very established as NHS specialists. We, we've been NHS specialists for more than 30 years, and certainly within the last decade or so, that that specialisation has narrowed even further into NHS cybersecurity, assurance, compliance. Um, we we pride ourselves on our on our kind of service excellence. We we think we've got a pretty good reputation for 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 delivering uh, and for hopefully acting as kind of trusted advisors, helping you guys get what you need in terms of visibility, compliance, and assurance. Um, yeah, we're working with a large chunk of the NHS um, at any one time, and we've got, obviously got a range of solutions and services that we think meet your needs as cybersecurity professionals. Um, yeah, there's the selection of our partners on the screen. I won't go through them, but essentially it's, we, we select the partners pretty carefully to hopefully make sure we're introducing the right technologies to, to meet those needs. Um, and my job on today's session is to kind of host it, hopefully deal with the questions that they come in. So just to repeat myself, for those of you that have just joined, please do post your questions in the chat. I'll be looking at those as we go through, but I'll also be giving a bit of an update on our flagship solution, which is the IT Health dashboard. So I'll, I'll, I'll be doing a little bit of that um, after uh, Jake's come in from the Isle of Wight. So Jake, thank you again for giving us your time and um, and your insight here. Um, for, for everyone's benefit, uh, IT Health and Isle of Wight has been a pretty long-standing partnership. Um, goes back more than a decade, certainly. Um, so yeah, we've we've hopefully helped over those years with with various kind of secure access, visibility, compliance type initiatives. And Jake, I'll, I'll let you kind of give it a bit, bit of an overview of, uh, of your story and, and what you've been up to. And as I say, if, uh, if people can post any questions, I'll, I'll kind of pose those at the appropriate time, really. Over to you, Jake. Oh, thanks, Andy. Thanks very much. And I'll just see if I've got control and I have a slide deck. Right, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. 
I'm Jake Gully. I'm the uh, Digital Ops Technical Architect at Isle of Wight NHS Trust. Uh, I wrote this presentation originally about six months ago. Uh, it has been, has been updated for this, but I wanted to give a honest, honest and warts and all uh, view of our journey to cyber compliance over the last three or four years. It has been messy, it hasn't been perfect, uh, and I'm not claiming to, but I will, I will give an honest impression and, and where these particular tool sets have helped us in that, uh, in that work. So, I'm job is technical architect. I'm effectively the infrastructure manager for the trust. I'm responsible for architecture, security, networks, telephone, and systems teams at Isle of Wight NHS Trust. Uh, I've been around for a while, quite long in the tooth, but from an IT perspective only, I've, I've worked 10 years in uh, the armed forces in an intelligence and security role, mainly traditional physical security, uh, but I was involved in a number of uh, early IT projects around comms data encryption, electronic warfare, some large databases, uh, and computer simulations for war, war gaming at a, at a number of levels. So very early, that was through the uh, late 80s and 90s. Uh, the last 25 years, I've worked primarily in uh, secondary and uh, primary healthcare roles, uh, working for the trust originally as network manager, uh, briefly as IT manager in 2014, and now uh, in that infrastructure manager role. Uh, we've been very lucky at Isle of Wight in avoiding direct involvement in cyber incidents, but we have had some direct exposure with WannaCry back in 2017, which, uh, which affected uh, five of our GP practices on the island. Uh, and I got to spend quite a lot of time in the cleanup for that. Uh, and in the last two years, the trust has been indirectly affected by uh, two major uh, incidents for for us both affecting our uh, our unplanned and ambulance service so two years ago it was the one advanced the Dastra incident and almost a year later uh, we had the Autobus Mobimed uh, ECPR system which again affected ambulance and our acute admissions into the hospital Isle of Wight NHS Trust is a small and uh, rather unique trust. Currently, and I say currently, it's not for much longer, we provide community mental health and ambulance services to a population of around 140,000. We employ 4,300 staff, and nowadays we operate just under 4,000 endpoints and 300 servers. The trust is is currently implementing a major infrastructure upgrade program uh, that includes a full network replacement, which is uh, which is about 50% complete at the moment. We're doing a data center refresh. Uh, we're replacing our uh, WANCOMs and building resilience into that connectivity off island for HSCN, internet, and Azure. Uh, we're doing a full telephone systems refresh and migration to SIP. We're putting in a new virtual desktop infrastructure and uh, and building real-time location and tracking applications on top of that new that new uh, network infrastructure. Alongside that, although not directly affecting me, we're also doing a similarly scaled clinical systems program, replacing community and mental health uh, electronic patient records. We're replacing our acute PAS and uh, acute EPR, it's, although that's currently paused and under review. Uh, we're doing a data warehouse and data management uh, implementation and rolling out a host of new pathology applications uh, based around limbs, but also around the uh, around digital pathology, and blood tracking, and uh, and some of the new uh, cellular pathology analyzers, etc. Um, just for a little bit of extra spice, as if we didn't have enough on, we are currently disaggregating our community and mental health and learning division. That's about 25% of our overall uh, overall staff as a trust, including a uh, including a slice of our corporate services. 
uh, and that will be part of a new Hampshire and Isle of Wight uh, healthcare foundation trust, I think is the agreed title, or Project Fusion, if, uh, if some of you have come across that. Uh, and we're converging our remaining corporate acute and ambulance functions under a single board with Portsmouth. So all in all, quite busy and quite challenging at the moment. It, uh, it keeps us on our toes. So if I just brief, briefly start from where I picked up again in 2019, uh, I came back to the trust in September 2019 and inherited quite a challenge. Uh, we'd had the usual lack of investment. I, not uncommon, everyone will have experienced that uh, over the previous six years and a Mars program that had effectively hollowed out uh the the sort of senior members of my it team and flattened the structure uh that's quite important i'd lost some critical capabilities there at this time we we had a smaller fleet about two and a half thousand endpoints and we're halfway through an unfunded unfunded windows 10 deployment and the majority of our end user devices at that stage were probably between five and nine years old uh only about half of our endpoints were on Windows 10 and less than 5% of our servers uh, were onboarded in MDE uh, and managed. We had a, quite a big legacy problem. Uh, I put down in my notes, I had 142,008 servers and 1,400 Windows 7 endpoints. I think I was being a bit shy because I also had a, uh, a handful of uh, Windows 2003 about a dozen end of life versions of Linux and uh, and somewhere in the back end of Windows 2000 servers still running when I came back in. So quite a large legacy environment. Most of it was unmanaged uh, and we were uh, and we were very late for the uh, for the end of life for 2008 and Windows 7, which was staring us at in January of the next year. And I've forgotten to click through those points. So I went through the slide. But I think the team itself was very small at the time. I had a total team of 17, uh, and that was uh, and that was delivering all of that all of that activity and running the service desk for the trust. So I had very little BAU resource to deliver those upgrade programs. My immediate priorities on coming back were really to get all of my devices onboarded into MDE. Uh, it wasn't pretty. I had some uh, dire exposure scores. I had a lot of servers that weren't being routinely updated uh, and was deep in the red. My sec second priority was to get a business case and funding to secure the resourcing to complete our Windows 7 migration uh, and to be able to establish the hardware requirements for those endpoints upgrades. Uh, there was a lot of unknowns. We we had a uh, we we knew what we bought and deployed over uh, over the last nine to ten years, uh, but we didn't really have any active way of monitoring and managing that and seeing exactly what we needed to take it forward. So my main issue was visibility, uh, and this hit us straight out of the blocks. We had very limited reporting. We had an old instance of SCCM 2007. It was very broken, and the staff member who had built and supported that had taken Mars back in 2018. So we didn't have the skill set really to fix or work, work and get reporting out of that. We had... Uh, historic information uh, in our old IT service management product. Again, this asset database was probably correct when assets were entered, but wasn't maintained and was unreliable. So to fill this gap, we went out and purchased an initial year of the, uh, of the IT health assurance dashboard in around February 20. Uh, this was absolutely essential tool for us being able to visualize and report our overall compliance 
but also to inventory the hardware and software and through that to build the business case for our upgrade and migration plans. Uh, that, was, uh, that, that was essential. Uh, lots of parallel benefits out of that. It gave us our, uh, it gave us significant reporting capability towards DSPT and also ad hoc reporting for our service desk teams uh, as they went out and built those machines. Uh, it also gave us tools for deployment of software patches, minor software deployments and registry files. Really, really, really useful service desk tool uh, to help them. Uh, another ad major advantage we got from this was uh, using it as a tool to drive our migration from Sophos Enterprise Manager, which was a traditional on-prem installation, over to Sophos Central Intercept X. And this was, this was provided for us by the IT Health staff working remotely using, uh, using the uh, IT Health Assurance dashboard to drive that project. Uh, and was really, really light touch for my staff. So it was a huge help at the time. Um, one year wasn't enough. We came back in, uh, uh, we came back in uh, the end of that year and uh, renewed for a further three years. So uh, still, still enjoying that, pro that facility, getting a lot of value out of it, uh, but essentially giving us the ability to manage our, uh, our hardware endpoints and, uh, and see them. So we went through 20 into 21. Uh, we managed to uh, drive through and complete our Windows 7 uh, and 2008 programs uh, over those two years, despite the uh, despite the uh, uh, impacts of COVID and the reprioritization. We changed our rolling replacement program to factor in Office 365 requirements. And we were helped a little bit along with some additional COVID funding. It was very relaxed, obviously, in that uh, in that first year, uh, and that helped us considerably to achieve our targets. We also uh, changed our uh, server licensing model uh, and went over to a, uh, a ski enterprise agreement with Microsoft. But one of one of the main advantage of that was it gave us uh, access to all the uh, system center tools. Uh, within that uh, within that license agreement uh, and that gave us the ability to deploy enterprise configuration manager we added patch my pc for third party vendor patching but that substantially helped us to manage our uh, patch deployment reduce our overall exposure scores uh, and we ecm also replaced our deployment toolkit uh, which we were using before and halved our, uh, halved our machine build deployment times. So it had a substantial impact on that program. The gap, well, the uh, early final, we were feeling pretty smug. I think it has to be said, end of 21 coming into 22. We had a good handle on our managed IT devices. We knew what they were, we were patching, we were managing them. But we did, you know, when we tallied everything up, we, we knew we had 2000 devices on the network that we couldn't see, couldn't interrogate, couldn't get any information back. Uh, we knew roughly what they were from our, uh, from our IP, IP address spreadsheets and historical records, but it wasn't accurate data. Uh, and there was very little information about what was happening on those devices. Uh, Overall, there's a, a significant unmanaged, there's about 25% of my estate there, which I can't see, I can't manage, I don't know what uh, what versions of software, what, uh, what vulnerabilities they're exposed to. So it's a substantial, uh, substantial concern for me in terms of managing our overall attack surface. As we got towards the end of, uh, end of, uh, 2122 uh, I was introduced to a product called order through uh, through our ICS CIO group uh, and this was uh, this was introduced to us by uh, 
uh, Southampton who had deployed it. I think they were the first in the region to put an IoT IOM solution in. We started talking to NHS Digital around uh, UTF funding uh, and went out to do, do a full review of the market to see what was available. It was a very rapidly expanding market at the time. Uh, the main players in there, Order, Clarity, Cynario and Stylera, uh, all slightly different, offering different things. We went out and demoed and did proof of concepts of three of those three of those products. Uh, we managed to get funding through UTF to cover us, uh, but the money didn't actually come until about March 22. Uh, so we had to do some brokerage and get it get it rolled over with finance into uh, into uh, next financial year for us to actually spend that. Uh, but we went through a uh, competitive tendering process, mini tender process. In the end, we chose Cynario. And the reason we chose Cynario for IoT IOM was their demonstration of, of commitment really to develop that product at pace for the UK NHS market and to build the key integrations that we wanted with medical equipments, uh, equipped database, with Cisco ICE, with uh, with checkpoint firewalls, effectively to make it a a turnkey solution for us in into our environment. Uh, and another key point was the with our new what wired network infrastructure, uh, we had the ability to virtualize this the collectors at at each of our uh, distribution network nodes. So again, it's a, a major advantage to have that visibility across the whole layer three infrastructure uh, and to be able to collect that data easily. We made this decision before, uh, before I think uh, IT Health and Cynario went public with their, uh, with their partnership, uh, but the integration between the health assurance dashboard and, uh, and Cynario was extremely welcome news for us and has been, uh, has been very valuable. The engagement with Cynary was excellent. We placed our order in October 22. I think we had the collectors delivered within a week. Uh, we had them connected up and installed with remote support uh, and set up collecting data for live training in mid-November. Uh, we ran that training in-house. We had a uh, we had a uh, I think four staff from Cynario came down and delivered that. Uh, so that was technical and customer success elements. Uh, it was well attended. It's it's a broad project. Uh, so for us, it meant uh, it meant bringing in the uh, uh, the key staff for us, and it, it's beyond IT and digital. We needed our medical electronics teams. We wanted our estates, pathology, radiology, and pharmacy staff to be in. The, these staff all got access and training in it that day, and most of them are still using the product at the moment. So it's uh, it provides different insight and use uh, across a broad range of uh, broad range of hospital services. Uh, and I think that's part of the success, really being able to drive this product out beyond uh, beyond a cyber compliance solution as well. It wasn't completely painless. We, ha we had a few legacy infrastructure issues. Uh, it, it, none of that was Cynario's fault. It was a it was a historic bug within our uh, Cisco uh, core core switches, uh, which. Uh, which caused some fairly major disruption and it caused our uh, our switches to stop connecting the uh, the wireless controller vlans uh and disrupting all of our wireless i think we had two dropouts before we managed to uh, rectify and sort that sort that problem but it was a fairly major impact uh but a uh, a cisco a cisco issue that we hadn't come across until we started collecting span data 
but it is worth mentioning if anyone's going down this route to make sure your firmwares are updated uh, and you're happy and perhaps you roll out a little less less aggressively uh, with that collection plan to uh, to see that you've uh, you've got it all. So I think getting the product in is is half the thing. The ability for us, the key key vis, key key ability of this product is to give visibility, reporting and mitigations to the uh, to those uh, vulnerabilities we have on that IoT IOM attack surface. It's bigger than we thought. We uncovered a lot of things we didn't expect to be seeing on our network, uh, and uh, it has enabled us to harden our network design to actually uh, to actually manage those and contain them. Uh, implementing north, north to south segmentation at our perimeter firewall for all those devices that don't need that access out, really basic and simple to do. Uh, more difficult for us was implementing east west segmentations. Uh, we are getting there now it's it's been a work in pro progress but uh that's substantially been a driv uh, driven by our network upgrade and the uh and the integration with cisco ice so we're now in a position where we can do that substantially over most of our distribution network and the remainder will come on board uh in the next uh, in the next month or so uh you're not you're not tied to using a product like uh, ICE, you can you can work exclusively with ACLs, uh, and Cynaria will actually help you build those those ACL rule sets out, and uh, and test them. Uh, but it's a uh, but it's much easier to do it with a sort of central management product. So that full east west is dependent on deployment of ICE. Uh, Future integration. We, we've just upgraded our uh, equip medical e equipment database. Uh, the uh, the integration is free from the Cynario side. They provided this as part of the uh, part of the product, uh, but we do have a a small cost to enable that within our new uh, equip instance, uh, and are just looking to get that one signed off at the moment. But that will be a key a key uh, integration for us as well. Uh, we now have the integration in place with Cisco DNA spaces uh, and we are gradually rolling out our real-time location tracking for our medical equipments as we deploy our new Wi-Fi infrastructure over the uh, over the site. So we have it that's working, but the coverage is limited and we're just rolling out the rest of our new uh, new Wi-Fi infrastructure for that. I beg your pardon. So summary, I've really sort of focused on that health assurance dashboard and sign area and how they've provided that visibility for us. Um, I, it's, off, it's often the case with, uh, with, there's a huge range of tool sets and capabilities that are out there. The, these are two that we've and, and I think probably we're all guilty of purchasing purchasing products that are there as audit recommendations or tick boxes for uh, either DSPT or some other external audits that we've gone through. Um, I, I can 100% say that this is not the case in these. These have genuinely filled a requirement to provide for visibility and help us manage that compliance. They've made us much more efficient in how we're able to manage our resource and do that do that work, uh, and to uh, and to reduce our overall exposure score. I think I think it's interesting just to see really broadly how these capabilities map out onto uh, onto cyber uh, frameworks. So we've got the NCSC cyber assessment framework. And I think really here we're looking at the uh, managing security risk domain A, and we're looking at the uh, asset management and risk management 
uh, categories there. We're looking at the defending against cyber attack, uh, and we're looking really B1 to B5 with, within this domain as well. Uh, and a little bit as we as we build out on the uh, on the integration, uh, the minimizing the impact of of D1. It doesn't reply 100% on on integration. A lot of this is is suggested for you anyway. You can do it manually, but you're getting you're getting all of those benefits uh, from from Scenario and, and many of them also reinforced from the uh, health assurance dashboard. If we looked at the NIST, and I prefer the, the NIST model for doing this, the framework, really we've got uh, we've got capability across all of the first four pillars, identify, protect, detect, and respond. Uh, it doesn't help us so much on recovery, but it's broadly, broadly assisting the whole, the, the whole of that uh, uh, framework model for us. I think just finishing off, just just a taste and i know uh, i know andy will go into into this in more detail uh for those of you who haven't seen it this is a, a screenshot from the new health assurance dashboard we've been demoing this for the last uh, for the last six months really really good i like the old one i still use the old one for some reporting but in terms of getting information and being able to provide views for my own internal reporting I find this exceptional, Re really quick response, really good to be able to filter. It also does draw in the uh, the IoT, IOM devices, so integrates with Scenario to give us some joint reporting on both. And I'll leave the rest to Andy to cover. Uh, and I think also- <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, thanks for the tee up. I'll obviously go into Oh, sorry. There's 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 a bit more from you. Carry on. There's, there's just a, very, a a little bit more on the scenario stuff, uh, and just a few of my favourite. I really like the uh, this. It's we know we have a lot of exposure in our in our IoT IOM devices. It's being able to concentrate the effort on where the biggest rewards for us. So to be able to view and manage our resource based on safety. Uh, based on confidentiality and the risk of service disruption is really, really important for us and allows us to prioritize our response. Uh, the ability to categorize our assets and be able to see, you know, at a glance what our exposure is, where we have, uh, where we have red or orange exposure risks under those, uh, how we, how we map to, uh, to care cert uh, compliance uh, and also DSPT reporting. And I, DSPT reporting is a big plus for both of these products, uh, but they substantially provide probably uh, probably 60, 70% of our, of our total output for uh, DSPT, which is a, a massive time saver. And there you go, Andy. I'll finish on, finish on questions and hand back to you. Well, yeah, but there are some questions. I think I'll address them now, um, just in case there's not time at the end. So uh, first one from Phil. Thank you, Philip. Um, it relates to the equip integration, just to see if you yeah. can give a little bit more information around how that how that works from your point of view and what, what you're hoping to get out of it. Yeah, so the, so the equip installation prov provides a direct link and product update. So, so our medical electronics have run equip in isolation for many years they effectively log and enter these assets when they come into the organization uh, again like us historically they probably haven't been keeping a live view updating product versions patches and release information on those they lose a lot of product they're not necessarily sure of what they're seeing when it's last used when it's been on the network the, so the integration gives us the ability to see how assets are being used across our estate. Uh, it's continually updating information on software, uh, software firmware versions on those, uh, and providing the uh, uh, background integration of of how they're communicating. So what what their what those products are communicating with, how you can. Uh, uh, if effectively build up that sort of baseline 
picture of of activity for those whether it's infusion pumps or uh, or patient monitors you you can see where the key key points are what it needs define their uh, uh define their sort of peer groups communication groups and then really sort of micro segment those down uh the the integration provides a live view and keeps builds that database in, increases that data set uh and uh and keeps that sort of information on utilization it's much easier for them to identify assets that fall out of use uh and aren't being used uh and i think also with with Cynaria, it gives a really on all the IOM, it gives a really useful view of how devices are being used. Yeah. So instead of just saying we have 180 infusion pumps across the organization, we can actually look at them in areas and see how they're being utilized and where they're not being utilized. Uh, and actually, uh, medical electronics now can use that data to see whether they can move stuff around the estate rather than going out and buying, buying more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I believe it's a two-way integration as well. So yeah, there's, there's, benef there's benefit for the clinical engineering team to see all of that, but also um, any data that Cyneria can't see from sort of scanning, you know, device owners and stuff like that, that, that would be manually populated into Equip. Cyneria can ingest that the other way. So they kind of enrich each other uh, in that sense. Great. Thank you, Jake. I'll, I'll move on just so that me and James have got a little bit of time just to do a couple of producty bits where it will be fairly brief um, and there will be a little bit more time for questions right at the very end if people can hang on for that. Uh, there are a couple more questions which I'll plan to address at the end. But as I, as I kind of alluded to at the start, most of you on the call will already have the IT Health dashboard or certainly if you haven't, you'll, you'll be aware of it. So I don't need to go overboard with this but as Jake also alluded to we do have a new version so that that's the um, the agenda for my bit today is just to give a little bit of an update on that and obviously if people want more information uh, please let us know via the chat or via the survey at the end um, so I'll try and condense what's normally a sort of a 30 minute talk into more like five minutes so here we go um, so the first thing to say is that the new IT Health dashboard now accounts for all of your assets so whereas you know up to the last up to a year ago we were probably very focused on the IT assets with 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 Landsweeper as our sole source of information um, we're now we're now addressing all of the other unmanaged assets to give you a true sort of single source of truth for everything um, in terms of how that's come about obviously we've we've been doing the dashboard now for around about seven years it was all designed originally for visibility assurance you know the, the, the old adage you can't secure what you can't see that was what we that was our mission statement to try and address that and to try to help you with your compliance uh, pain points particularly around dspt and cyber alert so landsweeper was the tool that we chose for that we still think landsweeper is the best tool on the market for identifying the uh, identifying and cataloging the managed IT equipment that's on an NHS network. Um, over the years, that's obviously grown. We recognised a couple of years ago that medical devices and IoT were, were, were a requirement for people alongside those managed assets that Landsweeper's scanning. So we needed a new partner for that. So we needed to find the right partner to introduce into those sort of 150 NHS dashboard customers. We I, I did very similar to Jake, did quite a in-depth market analysis um, to see what was out there and what what might fit best. The re some of the reasons we settled on Sony were actually very similar to, to what Jake said earlier. So that, that they're a healthcare only provider, very much like IT Health. Um, we that that healthcare focus means that they can also help to address the very specific compliance issues that I've already alluded to. Again, as Jake said, that kind of understanding of what those devices do within a hospital therefore helping you to prioritize your remediation not just on CVE risk but also on potential impact in a hospital setting and Cynaria's sort of willingness to work with us to integrate and to allow us to ingest their data so that you you are kind of IT Health dashboard customers can view everything in one place rather than having a separate dashboard for managed and one for unmanaged um, we can actually give you everything in one place 
and that, that kind of brings us on to today where we, we've just launched the new version of the IT Health dashboard. So very briefly what that is, it's still everything that it always has been. So all of this stuff that we've always done within Landsweeper isn't going anywhere. So, you know, our bread and butter around it, cyber alerts and DSPT, we're still doing that, but been improving on it. Um, Above that, there's a raft of new features, which are summarized here. I've not got time to go through them, but fair to say that there's a lot of stuff here that you guys have been asking us for for a while, particularly around things like risk prioritization, um, role-based access, 2FA, and around some of the integrations, which I'll kind of settle on just to hopefully explain what we've done. So yeah, whereas for everyone up to around about a year ago, everything was delivered within Landsweeper. So we've been customizing Landsweeper into a NHS cybersecurity dashboard. Uh, we're now, um, we've now released a new, a new interface, which is separate from Landsweeper, designed by IT Health from the ground up for NHS cybersecurity and compliance. So it's far more useful, far more usable, far more intuitive, as Jake says, it allows you to get to the data you need far, far more easily uh, without having to mess around in Excel or or SQL or anything like that. But also by separating ourselves from Landsweeper, we also are able to ingest other data sources to, to enrich that Landsweeper data. Landsweeper is not going anywhere for us at the moment. As I said, we still think that's the right tool for those managed assets. But obviously if you are interested in bringing in the unmanaged, so the medical and the IoT, we can take that feed from Cynerio and probably most importantly for all of you, we can also enrich the Landsweeper data for the Windows assets with hooking into your MDE, whether that's um, the NHS tenant, your local tenant, or a combination of them both, we can hook into them and compare the Landsweeper data that we're getting to, the, to what we get from MDE to, to give you a really accurate picture. And to stop you from doing those manual comparisons of which machines are miss, missing from, the, from where, um, Hopefully that will make sense. We've, we've got more integrations to come. These ones are pretty much ready, Cisco and Rubrik. We will be seeking your feedback from as customers to kind of see where we need to prioritize next. Uh, just very, very briefly to show you what the new platform looks like. This is kind of an asset list view. So hopefully you can see now, uh, rather than within Landsweeper, we have a last seen date, which is only based on Landsweeper. We now have a, a global last seen. So if we know that Landsweeper can sometimes struggle if devices are offline or um, firewalled or there's some credential issues, sometimes Landsweeper can struggle. Um, that by, by looking at MDE, Sophos, Cynerio and some of the other integrations that are coming, we can give you a far more accurate picture of whether a device is truly active, even if it's not scannable from Landsweeper. So that, that's a big, a big thing and a big change. Um, and then as we move into kind of filtering in on groups of assets or individual assets, you'll see that this risk scoring carries through. So we're, we're giving you a, a feel for how risky that device or those groups of devices are as you filter in. And then there's a series of um, tab views within the asset, looking at how you can recommend the actions to reduce risk, um, Windows updates, so patching history, missing updates, vulnerable out of date and complete software inventory per asset, cyber alerts that relate to the asset, and then obviously all the CVEs that we're seeing. And then this, this view in source button is your link back to the source dashboard. So if you wanted to view this Windows asset in Landsweeper, this is where you would click and that would automatically launch you out to that relevant system so you can see any additional detail that you might need from that source system. So that's that's kind of everything I wanted to show you for today. The, I guess the other thing just to touch upon is the, is the KPI trending that we're doing. So very briefly, we, we've introduced a series of KPIs, which are kind of, yeah, linked, linked closely around the DSPT requirements so that you can actually see, rather than just giving you a score, actually seeing where, where you're trending, if things are getting better or worse. Uh, we'll also be introducing some benchmarking into this so that you can see how your trend and your score will compare to your peers. Uh, so that, that's to come fairly imminently. Um, hopefully that all made sense. It was a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I can't see any new questions in the chat at the moment. So 
uh, I'm just checking that. So I'm more than happy to pass over to James. If anyone does have any questions specifically on IT Health Dashboard new version, as I say, feel free to drop, drop them in the chat or put them in the survey or just give me a call after the session. But uh, James, hopefully I've left you enough time. Over to you. I'll pass you the, um, the controls if you bear with me. Yeah, cheers, Andy, and uh, thank you, Jake, for that sort of great overview of the work we've done so far, Isla White. So I'll be, like Andy, quick overview of Scenario, what we are, why we do it, and how we do it. So just want to start off to say that we are a healthcare-only company. Uh, so as the title suggests there, we are a 360-degree healthcare, IoT, cybersecurity, and DSBT governance platform. So a bit of a mouthful. But really what that means is we understand healthcare, we understand healthcare environments, and we're very much tailored everything we do around healthcare. And in the UK, a lot of the work we do is around the NHS, as Jake showed with the dashboard you've created around DSBT and also around Cyber Alert 2 as well. So as it says there, our goal is to secure every IoT, OT and medical device in a healthcare environment. So we've been in the UK for a couple of years now. So as a company, we are six years old, but been in the UK for the last two years. Uh, had great success over the last couple of years. As Andy mentioned, we worked very closely with ID Health over the last couple of years, which would be fundamental to our success. Uh, but now we are working with over 30 to maybe 35 customers in the UK. As you can see, Isla White in the middle there uh, at the forefront and very good sort of response and very good feedback from our customer. So as we mentioned, this is a growing market, uh, not just in the UK, but globally. But in the UK, we are a leader when it comes to IoT, medical device, visibility and security. So happy to sort of talk about these in more depth after the call, but a good overview of who we are. So we've been in the UK about two years, 30, 35 customers growing continuously and very good feedback from our customers. So why do we do what we do? Uh, as we all know, the landscape of devices has changed quite dramatically over the last couple of years. And now that we see that 35 to 45% of all devices are now unmanaged, unknown IoT and medical devices. So a large proportion of all devices on the network are these type of devices, which is great for operational wise, great for seeing patients. However, they come with a certain set of risks and characteristics. Uh, they're designed to connect, designed to talk to each other, no built-in security, and a lot of these devices can't take an agent. Uh, out of the customers we have, we see that two to 4,000 uh, is the average of vulnerabilities per NHS trust we work with. Nearly half of medical devices and IoT device at least one critical vulnerability on them. Uh, 26 is the average in the UK, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 74 is the record though, of legacy operating systems we see on a network in the NHS. Uh, 50 to 20 percent of medical devices have ransomware vulnerabilities and obviously we've all seen the effect of ransomware on the networks from WannaCry 2017, uh, in 2021 HSC in as well uh, and still a fifth of all devices still have ransomware vulnerabilities. And the last one always shocks me that 90% of all PAC servers have critical vulnerabilities. So a large percent of PAC servers, 90% of all PAC servers on your network still have a critical vulnerability on them. So this is why we do what we do. So I'll tell you, tell you very quickly what we do. So first and foremost is give visibility of all devices on your network. I think Andy said it earlier, you can't secure what you can't see. So what we do is tell you all the assets, uh, IoT, OT, and medical on your network in this nice table form. So you see exactly what's on your network. You can see how many devices in that type you've got. For example, you can see I've got 10 CT scanners on my network. Nine have got critical vulnerabilities, one hasn't. So very good, easy, holistic overview of all devices on your network. See exactly what you've got, how many of each device, and also the vulnerabilities and risk associated to them as well. Quite importantly to mention here, we do all this passively, so we don't sit in line at all. If we fall over, there's no network impact whatsoever, and we don't need agents either. So we are agentless. So again, as I mentioned in the last slide, a lot of these devices can't take an agent, so being agentless helps us get full visibility of all these devices. What we do then is prioritise based on clinical risk. So again, being healthcare only, 
allows us to understand devices, what they are. So what we do is tell you everything about the device. We tell you what the device is, the make, the model, the operating system, the IP address, the connect connectivity, and lots of granular information about the device. But what we do then is prioritize based on clinical risks I mentioned. So we understand what a device should be doing. So when two devices for the same critical vulnerability, but one's connected to a patient, for example, MRI scanner, and one's an IP camera, we understand the, uh, the risk associated to them is very different, and the mitigation steps then should be different and accordingly to what the device is as well. So again, understanding the device, understanding the clinical risk, and uh, accordingly sort of setting the mitigation against that. So we do that on an individual basis, but we also do it holistically across the environment too. So as Jake said earlier, we, we prioritise risk based on patient safety, so those devices connect to patients, patient confidentiality, so is there any patient data going across the network and clear text, and service disruption too. And also what we help do is prioritise risk across the organisation. So what we do here is a heat chart, so the bottom is severity of the risk, but also more importantly as well, is a probability that happen. So the ones down here, yes, very high severity, but the probability that happens very low. You really want to focus up here in the right hand corner where that sort of probability is very high and the severity is very high. So if you sort of prioritize these, then you are reducing the risk across your network. So there's three things we do all together. So first and foremost is visibility and understanding what's your network. Then we're very much preventative risk management. So understanding and prioritizing the vulnerabilities on every device. So we tell you what the device is, then we tell you all the critical vulnerabilities associated with the device. But more importantly, we tell the mitigation steps on how to stop that going any further and your environment being affected. So protect your critical vulnerabilities and devices before attack. So understanding what they are, prioritize them for you and tell you mitigation steps. As you can see here, reduce that risk from a 9.8 out of 10 down to a 2.7. But we understand that sort of bad actors are very good at what they do. And sometimes bad things do happen. They do get into your network. So what we do then is be very responsive. So we call it attack detection response. So when the attack is happening, we can tell you in real time what the attack is. We can tell you how to stop it. We can tell you mitigation steps. We can automate those for you as well. And we can also be on hand to help you and talk through what the incident and what to do next. So our, our team called Scenario Lives on hand, they tell you notes, they can be in a phone call for you as well. So real-time protection against zero day attacks too as well. So stop the attack in real time before it affects the rest of your network. As I mentioned, our Scenario Live team's there on hand to talk you through the real-time events uh, and we validate everything you do as well. So if your alert goes off, uh, you know it's a real-time event, there's no alert fatigue, and again, as I mentioned, we're on hand to assist you, advise you, to help you stop that before it affects the rest of your network. Uh, and then a sport, as I mentioned, so we're there on hand, so we can talk through everything with you. So after you deploy us, as Jake mentioned previously, we're very much on hand to talk through everything. So we assign you a technical account manager, we assign you a customer assess manager, and we're very much there throughout the process. So helping you train up, understand what's important to you, setting policies, uh, setting everything for you across departments to make sure the system's properly working for you. We're not a technology that puts in a walk away. We're very much helping you there to move the needle when it comes to cybersecurity. As I mentioned, again, the cyber, the cyber live teams on there to help you throughout the process too as well. So I know I have a short limited amount of time there, so hope I covered off who we are, what we do and why we do it. Uh, if you are interested, obviously happy to have a further conversation uh, offline and do a demo for you. And we do offer, also offer proof of values, which many of our customers do to make sure we work in your environment. And these are very structured with timescales, uh, with commitments and proper success criteria to make sure you are getting the best value out of uh, POV. So I hope that's... Uh, Covered everything, Andy. Sorry, very quick there, but uh, happy to take any questions as well. Yeah, good work, James. Thanks. That was uh, it was a bit of a challenge squeezing it in, but you did it pretty nicely. Oh, sorry, I'm just scrolling through your presentation. I'll uh, I'll just get back to the correct slides. So we're not confusing people. Um, I'm just having a look to see if there's any new questions. Um, bear with me a sec. Oh, we've got we did have a question for you, Jake. If you if you can answer this one quickly. Um, in terms of the numbers of IoT and IOMT devices, was it, was, did Cinerio 
kind of match your expectation or did it discover unexpected or surprise elements? I th so, you know, Windows managed desktop, managed servers, we, we had a really good handle on. We, we knew there were uh, about 3,000 plus devices that we didn't directly manage, but we did know what, you know, what a thousand of them were. We knew, you know, we, we knew we had infrastructure switching, wireless access points, uh, and we knew pretty much where our uh, Cisco phones were. Uh, but beyond that, once we get into the CCTV, the uh, door access controls, the uh, the fridge monitoring, and you know all all of the sort of uh, IT, IOM, the drugs cabinets, and everything else, we ju we just didn't have a a clue. You know, we're, we'd historically been asked to provide IP addresses. Uh, those were entered into entered into spreadsheets, but other than a uh, other than a one word name, we didn't know what was there. We couldn't see it. We couldn't interrogate it, uh, and uh, it was a uh, it it was a complete black hole. So about two thousand devices of just over nine thousand, I think, currently are yeah. in that uh, in in what I would call IoT IOM, but I am excluding my Cisco phones and my wireless access points. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Um, I think that kind of concludes all the questions. As I said at the start, once I end the webinar in a minute, you will be asked to complete a Stuart survey. We'd be very grateful for your feedback there, even if it's brief or particularly if you need any follow up information. Other than that, just to say thank you for everyone for joining and particularly to Jake and James for joining as the speakers today. We will follow up with the recording and please let us know if you need anything else. Thanks again and goodbye. Thanks very much. Cheers all, thank you. Bye.